Wow, what do you got there? Oh, nothing. It's just my new engineer wear laptop. I'm gonna just check my email real quick. <laughs> Wow, that looks kind of complicated. Is it easy to use? Yeah, it's just more intuitive. I mean, it's like a Mac. Oh, I see, yeah. I like these buttons a lot, but I don't know about this goo based stuff because I just got all over the buttons and I don't know if that's okay or not. Man! Check out my email here. Sweet! Got my celebrity gossip going on over wow. there. Wow! Stupid Facebook. So this is the future. It Today on the show, we're gonna talk about what should have been my favorite movie of 2012, but what ended up being the most ultimately frustrating movie of 2012, Prometheus. We're gonna talk about the politics behind Prometheus, we're gonna talk about the problems with Prometheus, we're gonna talk about the original script with Prometheus, and we're gonna get to the bottom of what makes Prometheus so Prometheus-y. Like, I really feel like I have some new information that I haven't read anywhere else because I've done like so much research and I've watched this movie so many times now and I've watched the commentaries like twice and one time I fell asleep and it was like subliminally like leaking into my brain. So let me tell you where I'm at with Prometheus right now. This is where I'm coming from. I've done as much digging as any rational person should into this movie and what I've come up with is that I have a newfound respect for the film but they weren't wholly successful because it wasn't satisfying overall. But I have to give it props because it just kept me thinking about it. I'm still thinking about Prometheus and that's unheard of in this day and age with so much media all the time just like cramming into your eyeballs. To actually like have something that sticks out to you in your brain is amazing. Prometheus is a fascinating sci-fi film exploring concepts of cosmic horror and of mystery. But on another level, it's also a film so full of blunders that it leaves you feeling like you can't trust it at all to know what it's doing. If a film can't get the little things right, then how on earth am I supposed to have faith that the grand mysteries explored will have any value or meaning that they're going to solve this shit? And it makes you wonder, how far do the surface cracks go? So let's talk about the blunders that ruins this film in the average viewer's eyes. So let's just list them all off so we know we're on the same page. One, the geologists and biologists going around making bad decisions, playing with alien snakes. Two, these bitches running straight instead of sideways. Three, the old man makeup that's totally weird. And five, Shaw getting her stomach ripped open and then running around for 45 minutes afterwards. I now realize why these blunders are in the film, what happened, and most of them at least have an interesting reason of why they got like that. Oh my gosh, I watched deleted scenes on the Prometheus Blu-ray and man, they really helped this film out a lot. I am not sure entirely why they were cut out because they really give you a lot of insights into characters and correct a lot of things. They really made this film make a lot more sense. It made me like the film way better, way better. I don't know why they're not in the film. I guess it's just for some stupid pacing thing. And I think I now know why, like what was going on. And I don't mean plot wise, I mean politically. What was going on behind the scenes of Prometheus that made this film the way it is? Now let's talk about things the deleted scenes cleared up for me. Mom, stay quiet. This is okay. I can handle this. Hey, baby. Jesus, look at the size of that. What is it? You need to stay calm, okay? What's it to be calm about? You need to stay calm, because she is beautiful. She? What the hell makes you think that's female? Yeah, she's a lady. Look. Huh? She's mesmerized. Now let's talk about Milburn's poor life decisions. Let's briefly review what happened in the film that left us stupefied. Milburn and Fifield get creeped out and rightfully so. They decide to leave the expedition but end up getting lost in essentially a haunted house overnight. But then all of a sudden Milburn grows some balls when he's confronted by this alien space snake, tries to mess with it. By watching the deleted scenes, Milburn's deal is a lot clearer to me. So let's start by talking about the relationship between Milburn and Fifield. Now Milburn comes up to Fifield and he's like, hey, what's up, I'm a biologist, how's it going? And he's like, get away from me, I just woke up, whatever. And he's like, that's cool, whatever. He thinks, in my opinion, that Fifield is cool because he's got like a mohawk and some tattoos or something. Milburn, I think, kind of thinks that's cool and wants to impress him. And then later on, when they're being debriefed by Sean Holloway, they both kind of talk shit to them and like kind of team up against the other scientists being like, what, engineers, you're totally crazy. 
crazy. Now if we added the deleted scenes back into the film, the next scene would have been Milburn making a discovery of a little tiny alien worm. The first discovery of an alien creature ever. Oh, oh, oh my god, oh my god. Baby, look you're gonna this. wanna see this. Look at this. He's gonna be big. Milburn is gonna be huge when he gets back to Earth. He's gonna write some books. Think about it from Milburn's point of view. He's super pumped. He's gonna be famous now. Like, this is life. We found life. Come here, baby. Come on. All the other scientists are gonna like high five him. And they're gonna have champagne. And he's gonna win a Nobel Prize for this little weird worm that he found. And he's also impressed Fifield. It's a bromance in space. I guess we're really lucky we brought you Milburn biology. Clearly, we can see the relationship was more significant before it got all cut up. Anyways, fast forward, Fifield gets creeped out by the alien engineer body, and he's like, hey Milburn, he doesn't ask anybody else, he has Milburn, he says, hey, are you with these guys, or do you want to come with me, because this sucks, and this is totally scary. And Milburn's like, of course I'm going to come with you, this place sucks, and I don't like these people either, and we should totally hang out. So the whole thing culminates when Fifield and Milburn end up in the big headroom. Fifield's still creeped out, he's smoking weed, he's like, oh gosh. Milburn encounters a giant space snake. He tries to pet it because he's trying to be cool in front of Fifield. He wants to be like, hey, I'm a biologist, I got this, it's no big deal. Plus he's already encountered an alien species and it totally went fine. So he's like, well, let's just go for broke. And I'm gonna be like even bigger for discovering a space snake or whatever's going through his mind. And that's what makes it so tragic. That's what makes it so sad because all this guy's trying to do is just like show off to this other guy so they can be friends. It's like one of those crocodile hunter situations where you have people who like stick their heads in like crocodile's mouths like to show off for crowds, but then like it does go bad a lot. <laughs> like it goes bad more than you'd think. So now let's talk about Wayland for a minute. Man, isn't it an odd decision to cast Guy Pierce as a super old guy? Doesn't that just make no sense? And why does that makeup look so weird on his face? Well, chain of events. Originally, they were going to cast an older man, Max Van Sydow, to play Wayland. But then Ridley Scott came up with this new idea and he was like, I want to show Wayland in a dream sequence when he's a younger man, when David looks in on him. Side note, they were supposed to have dream sequences for a lot of the characters and it was really going to explain more about each individual character and why they are the way they are. David was going to look in on him in his dream sequence and see Wayland as a younger man hanging out with babes, like having a good time. Back to the story. Ridley Scott ends up casting Guy Pearce as a younger Wayland for this scene that ends up getting cut and you never see it in the film. And for some weird reason, he ended up just saying, fuck it, let's just have Guy Pearce as the old man the whole time. But it's just totally bizarre without that scene of him being younger, at least once in the film. Now the thing that I have a question with is, I've seen better old man makeup in Big Trouble in Little China from 1985 on James Hong who played David Lopan. But it's just strange that in almost 30 years they can't do a better old man makeup. Indeed. The whole problem is that Guy Pierce is far too handsome and far too in shape to ever convince anyone that he's an old man. They didn't even try to put like a little hump in his back. It's just a glaring problem that really sticks out, especially when all the other special effects are really top notch. Alright, so now we gotta talk about the Fifield zombie. In the movie, after Fifield lands in a puddle of black goo after getting his face all melted, he ends up showing back up at the ship as this weird zombie creature, okay? He's this monstrous guy on a rampage. And it really doesn't make a lot of sense as far as like the black goo. So they're trying to tell us that if you land in a puddle of it when you're dying or something, it'll like bring you back to life as some weird zombie. I don't know, doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you watch the deleted scenes, Fifield is turned into a mutant instead. He shows up, he has an elongated head, kind of like a xenomorph, long spindly arms, he looks totally creepy, and he's kicking everyone's ass. And he's a mutant, he's a mutant. The black goo is supposed to be a mutagen, and that makes so much more sense. I think that Ridley Scott ended up choosing to do the Fifield zombie instead of the Fifield mutant, because the mutant was in CGI. And I'm no big CGI proponent. In fact, I adore practical effects and like them much better. But in this case, although the practical effects did look good, it doesn't make sense storytelling wise. I wish he'd gone with the CGI. 
side blender, Shaw and Vickers running straight instead of sideways. This scene is really aggravating to me personally because as a woman, you have two women, they're running away and they're fucking running in a straight line and they just get smushed by the ship. All Shaw had to do was like roll around three times and she was fine. I wish they at least had a guy running straight too so it wouldn't make us all just look like a bunch of dumb idiots. Those women would not survive a crocodile attack on land. What would I have done in this situation? I probably would have run the other way. I would have done 90 degrees and I would have been fine. There's no explanation for this blunder. It's just stupid. MB! Why did the engineer kill everyone for like no reason? So in the movie, Wayland and David and Shaw, they're all there. They wake up the engineer. Shaw's like, oh, why did you kill us? And she gets like punched in the stomach some more. And then David asks the engineer a question who immediately proceeds to rip his head off, beat Waylon to death with it and kill everyone, okay? In the deleted scenes, the conversation between David and the engineer is far more spaced out and longer and it's actually a conversation, okay? David asks the engineer, this guy wants more life. He thinks that you can give him more life. And then the engineer asks him, well, why does he want more life? And then Waylon says, I want more life because I think I'm a god. I created this guy right here. I'm a creator just like you. And I shouldn't die because I'm a god and you're a god. We're gods here, it's cool. And then the engineer is like, no, fuck you. You need to sit down and kills Waylon after ripping off David's head. Now, this version of the scene also gives far more clarity to Waylon's intentions. It clearly defines why he paid a trillion dollars to go here, what he hopes to achieve. It's great, it has a nice payoff. So in the film, Shaw is forced to perform this grueling self-surgery on herself in the med pod, and that's all well and good, I can get behind that. But the fact that she like runs around afterwards for 45 minutes, run around the film and do gymnastics and jumping over stuff and getting punched in the stomach, it's crazy, it's crazy. And clearly, I'm not the only one who had a problem with it. And you know what? I can believe in future medicine that can heal you after having your chest cut open in eight hours. I can believe that, I can get behind that. What I can't get behind is getting your abdominal wall ripped open and then running around. I just, that's too much. I can't suspend my disbelief that far. It's in my opinion that these blunders are in the film because of multiple reasons. They tried to keep all the good things from the original script, but ended up kind of tweaking them and making them weird overall. Secondly, Ridley Scott openly says several times in the commentary that he does not like motherfuckers questioning him. He is like, I got two films in the Library of Congress, so eat it. Now when you listen to the editor's commentary on the deleted scenes, you discover that Ridley Scott was far more interested in pacing than he was with storytelling and character development. He wanted to make a film that moved flawlessly, and the movie did have really great pacing. But at what cost? I still do wish that they'd put those deleted scenes back in the film, because I do fervently believe that it makes the film better overall. <laughs> Today on Prometheus Origins, we're gonna talk about Chariots of the Gods, the book that inspired Ridley Scott, and we're gonna go over the original John Spade script that just leaked on the internet, because the real mystery behind Prometheus is how the script was made. I don't care, fuck it, we're doing it live, we're, we're just gonna do it live. Prometheus is a unique collaboration of efforts, arguably not for the better. A lot of people, myself included, have been really curious about John Spate's original script, which we now know is far more traditional and far more literal. And when in the history of movies has there ever been such a public outcry to read the original script of a film? I don't know if there's ever been. The script writing process behind Prometheus is a total clusterfuck mess. And that's what we're gonna talk about today because it's ridiculous and it's really fascinating, the politics behind it. And to all those wieners out there going, hey, the space script just leaked on the internet. It was a bomb, it changed everything. I had to rearrange my whole life around it, so give me a break, okay? It's taking a little longer than I thought it would. Now Ridley Scott's original inspiration for the film came from the book Chariots of the Gods by Eric Von Daniken. It came out in 1969 and it's really the first big ancient astronaut theory book. And what is ancient astronaut theory, you may ask? 
Ancient astronaut theory is the idea that ancient man was visited by extraterrestrials who in turn influenced mankind's development. There's a lot of shit that we cannot explain that happened in the ancient world, okay? And this guy provides a theory of why these things happen. Eric von Daniken theorizes that many religions are actually a reaction to encounters with an alien race. Side note, I'd like to take a moment to talk about Ridley Scott and his role as a director. Now in the media, it really paints Prometheus as Ridley Scott's baby, you know? Oh, this is Ridley's, this is all from the mind of Ridley Scott. And you know what? It really isn't. He's really just a director and a genius director. He's a great director. The movie, what he's interested in is world building and directing. He's good with actors. He loves putting a script onto film, okay? He quit writing in 1965. His main concern is taking a script, putting it on screen and making it completely believable. And I think he does an excellent job at that. I think that's why people like this film so much and why people are so disappointed in it. I think Prometheus is so intriguing because it is so well directed. It's a beautiful film and we all want to love it because Ridley Scott did an amazing job directing it. Let's get into the timeline of events that led up to this movie. Timeline for Prometheus. It all started back in 2004. Fox owns the rights to aliens. They were like, hey, why don't we do something with this? We'll make an aliens prequel. James Cameron was originally attached to direct their aliens prequel, but when Fox also announced that they were gonna do an aliens vs. Predator movie, Cameron was like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's just gonna water down the franchise and make it a big turd, and I don't want anything to do with it if you're gonna do an AVP thing. Well, Fox was like, screw you, Cameron, we're still doing it. And you know what, James Cameron was kind of right because it did water down the franchise. Thanks, Paul W.S. Anderson, you're a dick. Those movies were terrible. Think about it. I'm just as excited at the idea of a James Cameron alien prequel than I am a Ridley Scott alien prequel. And I can't believe Fox was like, hey, guess what? We're gonna go with Paul W.S. Anderson and screw you, James Cameron. Whoa, what a boner. <laughs> Side note, think about how cool a James Cameron aliens prequel would have been. I'm a huge fan of aliens. I was even Ripley in a power loader suit for Halloween like a couple years ago, and it was totally awesome. Get away from her, you bitch! Come on! <laughs> so, the Aliens vs. Predators movie comes out, and we all know what a giant fucking mess pile of crap those were. So fast forward to 2009, Ridley Scott expresses an interest in doing an Aliens prequel, especially with the idea of the space jockey, which has never really been done with any of the other Aliens films. No one's ever talked about the space jockey before. It's uncharted territory. So then, Scott Free has a production meeting with John Spates. John Spates is apparently the new like hot go-to guy for sci-fi scripts. Side note, I kind of feel bad for John Spates and that's kind of the reason that I'm making this video because he's a fantastic screenwriter who keeps getting screwed over by the Hollywood machine and he's virtually an unknown, although not so much anymore. Then someone's just like, hey, what do you think about an Aliens prequel? Apparently he has a lot of really good ideas about it. On the spot, he suggested the idea of the med pod scene and he states that that pretty much got him the job. Now what I think what happened is that Ridley Scott went to Spates and says, hey, I'm really into ancient astronaut theory and I really like this book, Chariots of the Gods, and maybe you should check it out and figure out a way to combine this with aliens and it's gonna be awesome. So just like, whatever, I'm Ridley Scott, you're gonna do whatever I tell you to do. So Spates gets to work and he ends up writing a really solid traditional script that's definitely an aliens prequel but also including the ancient astronaut theories. Has a nice solid script done by June 2010 that's ready to shoot. So at the last minute, Scott ships off the script to David Lindelof because he wants a second opinion because I don't know, maybe he feels like it's too much of an Aliens prequel. Lindelof comes back with all these notes saying like, I don't know, I have seen chestbursters before. We've all seen chestbursters before. This isn't really new territory. And Scott's like, oh shit, that's what I thought. I wanna do something that's crazy. And like, I don't know, maybe this isn't exciting enough for me anymore. Scott was really just asking for an opinion. He didn't immediately go for a rewrite from Lindelof, but he just really liked his opinion so much that he just went with it. So at that point, Lindelof got to work and Lindelof lies the script and made it more mysterious and shit and more like crazy. And he added the word Prometheus to it and all this other sort of stuff. And if you look at Lost and Prometheus, there's all these like 
interactive experiences online where you see all this like additional information that ties in with the movie and you can get all these little clues and stuff. They did the same thing in Lost. It's all Lindelof. He did it. And it was also Lindelof's suggestion that they not do a direct Aliens prequel and do a world kind of like parallel to it, which I think Ridley Scott really liked because he really didn't want to do an Aliens prequel anyways. He really just wanted to do an ancient Aliens movie. Fast forward to 2014 or 2015 when the sequel comes out and neither John Spates nor Lindelof is attached or writing the film in any way, shape or form, which leads me to believe that there are no answers to the questions. Even the writers, like the original writers aren't even attached like anymore. They're like, no, we're done. So before we get into the original Spates script, I'd like to take a moment to talk about John Spates himself. Apparently he's like some hot go-to sci-fi writer based on these two other scripts that he's written that have not been produced or made into movies. One of them being Shadow 19 and one of them being Passengers. Look, Passengers was so good that it was included on this list of screenplays that are really good screenplays that for whatever reason didn't get made. So this guy's a great screenwriter but just can't seem to get a friggin' movie made. And then he has this big break and he's gonna make a movie and Ridley Scott is gonna direct it and it's gonna be crazy and he made a really solid like traditional good Aliens prequel script and you can tell by the commentaries that he's kind of bummed about all of the changes that were made. Reading his script really made a hell of a lot more sense of a lot of things that were going on in Prometheus. But I guess I can't feel too bad for him because when has everyone just been like, oh my God, I have to read the original script. I mean, people are downloading his script. People are like all over the internet. It's like, oh, his shit's finally leaked. Thank God, I freaked out. I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to read it. In conclusion, I know that it sounds like I've really been bagging hard on Damon Lindelof, but I really don't blame him and think that he's some terrible writer that just ruined Prometheus, because that's not the case at all. He had a lot of really good ideas, I think, that added to the Spade script. It's just unfortunate that the whole mystery element went way too far and got away from all of them. I think that in the end, maybe a third person should have been brought in to rewrite the whole thing. This was a really complicated situation with a lot of moving parts. And I think Damon Lindelof's best product is yet to come. I don't know. In this next segment, we're gonna talk about the top six things that I liked better in the original Spate script. Number one, Shaw and Holloway's characters are a lot more likable. In the original script, it starts out, we spend 20 to 30 minutes with them while they make archaeologist discoveries underwater in these little submarines. There's this big stone tablet with the star markings on them that they find under the Mediterranean. And in another version of the script, there's even a stone tablet with the star markings found on Mars, which I think is really cool because it makes it irrefutable that the people who are here are space travelers. And because we get to spend more time with these characters, because they're developed and we have more of a relationship with them, it makes it all the more tragic when Holloway dies in this sex scene with him and Shaw, a chestburster bursts out in the middle of the coitus. <laughs> it's like this squid creature that's like has no bones and it's gelatinous and it gets loose and starts killing all these fools on the ship. Number two, the ancient astronauts theory is referenced, cited, and explained. In Prometheus, the ancient astronaut theories really aren't explained, and it's up to you to either know about it beforehand or find out about it afterwards. They don't spend a lot of time explaining it to you. But in the original script, the ancient astronaut theory was cited numerous times by several different characters. In Chariots of the Gods, Eric von Daniken goes on to tell us about all these ancient texts from around the world of all these different cultures who talk about their gods being these giants from the sky. And then Holloway references this point in the script by saying in all the old mythologies, the visitors from the skies were giants, which also tells us why the engineers look the way they do. They're giants because it's based on actual ancient astronaut theory. It wasn't a random decision to make them look like that. And David goes on to even describe the juggernaut engineership as a chariot of the gods. Characters even mention certain Bible passages which are referenced in Chariots of the Gods as literal instances of ancient man's encounters with aliens. Side note, in the opening scene, the black goo mutates into this scarab-like creature after dissolving the engineer and then they fly away off into the air. And then a primitive woman is shown being bit by one of these scarabs and then you see her DNA mutating. Makes sense, right? 
Maybe it made a little too much sense for Damon Lindelof. Number three, the alien tech. One thing that's really cool is that when they're inside the pyramid and it looks just like a regular hallway and there's nothing else going on, there's really all this crap going on around them that they can't even see because the engineers can see in a broader spectrum than we can. They can see like ultraviolet stuff and red stuff. I don't know. They can see all that crazy crap that we can't. And David can also see it. So that's why he can operate the ship and like the machinery and the technology that's going on is because he can see it. And the humans don't even know all this stuff is going on around them. Number four, Milburn and Fifield are far less retarded. In this version of the story, when they get lost, it's explained by a simple line where one of them says to one, hey, where are we on the map? And then the other one goes, I thought you had the map. And it's simple and it explains them getting lost without making them look super dumb. Even Yannick chides them for losing their maps and then later on when all the crew's toasting and they're stuck in there, he goes, to Milburn and Fifield, the first human beings to freak out, get lost, and sleep in their suits in the ruins of an alien civilization. And it's odd that this little maps bit got cut out of the final version because it's one of the biggest things that people complain about. How did these two idiots get lost in the future where they have all these crazy future maps? It was acknowledged in the original script, but somehow it didn't end up making it into the film. They thought about it. They thought about it. So why didn't it make it into the final version? I guess we'll never know. Side note, Milburn's death scene is a lot better. It doesn't make him look like such an idiot because he's like, there's a centipede instead of the snake thing, and he's playing with it, and he like, Fifield's like, what the hell are you doing? And Milburn's like, chill out, your fucking suit's bug proof, it's bulletproof. He explains that this suit should protect him from this creature, and that's why he's not bummed out about it or scared. But then things obviously go horribly wrong. That's so much better, that's so much better. Number five, the med pod scene. Now, we all know what happened in Prometheus, but in the original script, David purposefully infects Shaw with a face hugger and takes her helmet so she's stuck there in the ship. But she ends up like somehow getting back to the ship. She runs into the med pod and then st starts to try to get it out because we've never seen someone survive a chest burster. So in this scene, the chest burster starts coming out and then the machine takes it out, throws it out of the pod and then starts to sew her back up. And really the med pod isn't for really getting it out as much as putting her back together which makes sense. It's really cool when the alien bursts out, the med pod has like all these things exploding on the screen just saying like collapsed lung, broken ribs, like all the injuries that Shaw has and then goes to work fixing all of these things. And this process takes like hours. She's in and out of consciousness while all the surgery is going on to repair her. It's not really for getting it out, it's for fixing her back up. And it takes a while to fix her back up, which makes it so much more believable when later she's running around. And another thing that was really cool is that while Shaw is in and out of consciousness and getting all fixed up, she sees the chest burster over there growing up and then like killing somebody. It's really neat. Side note, something else that was really interesting was that the engineers were working on five different types of alien face huggers that made five different types of xenomorphs. Some of them are all gelatinous and have no bones. Some of them are armored. Some of them have spikes. <laughs> Some of them look like fish. Some of them have 20 arms, you know. <laughs> All the changes from the original space script were bad. In fact, a lot of the changes in Prometheus were really good. Oh good, tell me all about it. In the original script, Wayland Corp was your typical greedy corporation is greedy. Wayland's having a tough time terraforming Mars and they coincidentally happen upon alien terraforming technology and that's why Vickers goes bad. They lose their minds and Vickers is like, we gotta take this back because I'm totally gonna be the CEO now. Vickers bitchiness is well defined. She is a company woman. She's merely Wayland's right hand man. She's in the running to be CEO. Then she gets stuck on this four year trip to go on this expedition which knocks her out of the running. So she's like super pissed because she wants to bring this stuff back so she can be back in the race for CEO. If she brings back alien technology then she's totally gonna be set. And that's why Vickers makes the poor decision to stay and get this technology versus leaving even though she knows that there's all these crazy aliens running around killing people. And I'm really glad that they didn't go with that because we've all seen that before. In fact, we've already seen Wayland Corporation being evil and screwing people over for money. That's not new news. I'm glad they made the change to Wayland wanting more life 
versus the Whalen Corporation wanting alien technology. It really raises the stakes, it makes it a lot more interesting. Now let's talk about my favorite character, David. Now let's talk about my favorite character, David. Now in the original script, and Spates is quoted as saying, David is a bit more bloody handed. He infects Shaw with a face hugger on purpose. He's boastful of how he can see better than humans and he's faster and stronger and smarter. His contempt for humanity is palpable. It's even his idea to wake up the last engineer. He wakes the guy up because he's like, yeah, I just want to see what's going on here. It wasn't on Wayland's orders or anything. He was just inciting all this craziness because he's a crazy evil android. I like that David's character is far more subtle in Prometheus, and because David's character is far more subtle, it kind of makes him more human in a way. Like none of us are all good or all bad, we all have kind of a little bit of both, and so does David. And to be honest, in my opinion, I think David is the most interesting part of Prometheus by far. He's like the only character that's developed, which is kind of odd being that he is the only non-human on board, but whatever. If I was hanging out with David, first of all, he's fine, so I'd be like, hey, what's going on? Are you fully functional? From you, Data, you are fully functional, aren't you? Of course, but... How fully? In every way, of course. I am programmed in multiple techniques. If I was on board with David, I would like totally want to be friends with him. I'd be like, oh my god, what's your, your favorite movie, Lawrence of Arabia? Why? That's so weird. Let's talk about it. Let's watch it. I mean, David's always asking all these other people questions about why they're doing certain things, but nobody ever asked David anything. I feel bad for him. I understand human emotions, although I do not feel them myself. So the thing about David that's fascinating to me is that He's like the most advanced robot made by Wayland Industries to date. He's so advanced that he understands human emotions and like can simulate them in a social setting so he can like flawlessly fit in with humans. Now, even though he claims to not feel them himself, you are what you pretend to be, okay? So at what point if you just simulate emotions all the time, you're pretending to be a human all the time so you can fit in, at what point do these simulations become more than just simulations? Well, that would require the one thing that David will never have. A soul. You see all these people constantly telling him that you don't have a soul, you're not a real boy, and you can tell that he has his feelings hurt by it. And the fact that he likes a movie and like quotes it and even bleaches his roots to look more like Lawrence of Arabia, I'm sorry, but if you like movies, you have a soul, in my opinion, and I don't know why everyone's a dick to David all the time anyways. How are your lessons going, David? I almost forgot you're not a real boy. <laughs> what Prometheus made me consider was that, could a robot have a soul? This is something that we're gonna have to deal with at some point. Come on, would you enlighten us? What is required for sentience? Intelligence? Self-awareness? Consciousness? Prove to the court that I am sentient. This is absurd. And what's to say that they don't have a soul? Who's to say who has a soul and who doesn't? I mean, Shintoism proposes the idea that everything has souls. Radishes, rocks, the earth, even machines. Machines are included. I mean, it's not like a soul can really be quantified. It's not like I can point somewhere and say, this is where my soul is. It's kind of an imaginary thing anyways. So who's to say that a robot couldn't have a soul? Now tell me, Commander, what is data? I don't understand. What is he? A machine. Is he? Are you sure? Yes. You see, he's met two of your three criteria for sentience, so what if he meets the third? Consciousness in even the smallest degree. What is he then? I don't know. Do you? Do you? It seems to me that the entire movie, David's trying to hide the fact that he's more human than anyone realizes. I like the fact that he doesn't overtly hate humans. He's just kind of bummed out by them. He's smarter than everyone, and yet everyone like treats him like he's like a lesser person. You're making you guys pretty close, huh? Not too close, I hope. If I was hanging out with David, I'd be like, holy crap, you can do all this fucking math stuff in your brain and then do 10 other things at the same time and see different light spectrums? That's amazing. I would totally give him high fives over it. I'd be like, that's crazy, and give him his comeuppance. But nobody ever does. Everybody's just like, oh, whatever, he's just an android. Whatever, he's just an android. And that's why he's like, screw you guys. Like, come on, really? Like, I'm way cooler than that. 
Nobody gives him props, and that's why he doesn't like humans. We have all been dancing around the basic issue. Does Data have a soul? I don't know that he has. I don't know that I have. But I have got to give him the freedom to explore that question himself. And you can do a whole video on this all by itself, okay? You can do a whole video on this all by itself. So let's just move on. I'm glad that they changed David. He's really interesting. And if they do another movie, I would definitely like to see more of him. So uh, you uh, kind of have a thing for robots, don't you? I kind of have a thing for Michael Fassbender. <laughs> no, no, it's robots. Well, mate, well. Uh? Sure. Okay. They look like Michael Fassbender. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now let's take a moment to talk about the ending of Prometheus and the whole concept of going to paradise, the engineer homeworld. This ending was not in the original script, and I'm really excited to see the Engineer Homeworld if they ever make a sequel. The idea of going to the Engineer's planet is difficult because, I mean, what do these engineers do in their spare time? I mean, they have to have like a mundane everyday existence. It's not like every day they're going around drinking black goo and making a planet and seeding it with life or anything like that. I mean, do they go shopping on the weekends? Do they have engineer women and engineer babies? And do they go to their engineer malls? I have no idea what they're gonna do for this homeworld, and I'm really intrigued to see it. I also can't wait to see what the hell the engineers think of Shaw landing on their planet. She's gonna be all like, yeah, who's the space alien now, motherfucker? How do you like it? Like, what do they do all day? Do they have, do they have desk jobs? Let's talk about the whole Lindelof mystery deal. Was there too much? Maybe. In the original Spade script, there is like no mystery. Everything's spelled out for you, it's very literal, it's very traditional, all the characters are telling you what's going on. There is no mystery. I like the mystery. I think that's a great element to add. This story structure is really a great vehicle to support all sorts of mystery. And they did a really good job exploiting that, but they went a little too far with it, which is unfortunate. Side note on Space Jesus. Now, originally, we cited an article written by Cavalorn. This notion was debated wildly on the internet. Well, screw you guys, because in the original Space script, Space Jesus is totally recognized and gets his due. But I guess we know why they never came back to us. Something killed them off, back around the time of Christ. Maybe he was one of them, a great teacher sent from heaven, Jesus, the last engineer. And who knows, maybe Space Jesus will come up again in Prometheus 2, The Reckoning. In conclusion, the thing that I like the most about the Space script is the development of the characters. Their intentions are made clear, I understand them, I have more of a connection with them, which I like better, you know? I can't get behind a story if I don't care about any of the characters. That was done really well. And I think the average viewer probably would have liked this movie better as well because it's a very traditional sci-fi action horror movie. It's very much an alien prequel. Um, but it might not have been as memorable overall, I guess, in the scheme of things. We may have forgotten about it by now if it had just been the Spade script. But then again, we all know that the final version was so full of these weird blunders that maybe the Spade script would have been better. I don't know. I guess. We'll never know. So my final thought on why they decided to ditch the Spade script, even though they were like ready to film it, they were getting ready to shoot this script, is because the source material from Chariots of the Gods and the ancient astronaut theory is far more interesting than just making an Aliens prequel out of it. And I think that's why they ended up changing it so much and having Lindelof do a rewrite. It's because Ridley Scott really just wanted to do an Ancient Aliens movie. And while we're on the subject of Ancient Aliens, I want to tell you about another Star Trek Next Generation episode that shares a theme with Prometheus called Who Watches the Watchers? What is that? What is it? I don't know. So in the episode, this planet of like proto-Vulcan humanoids who are like in the Bronze Age stage of development are secretly being studied by Federation people. So one day, one of the Mentakans discovers their hideout, he sees people being beamed away and transported, and he's like, holy shit, and he actually gets electrocuted, and so they beam him up to the ship, 
and he like he sees Picard and he you know and I he's like oh the Picard. Picard and like thinks that Picard is a god and like he gets sent back down to his planet. I awoke in an incredible place and my wounds were gone. I was sure you were dead. I think I was. But I was brought back to life. And he's like, I've seen the overseer. Oh my gosh, this God that we used to talk about and our ancestors, you know, told us about that we've kind of ditched nowadays. He's real and his name is the Picard. And he saved me. So the Mentakans all jump on board with this guy on this religion of the overseer. So Picard realizes the that they've accidentally inspired a religion among these people and like that's not something that they want to do they want them to like progress past like superstition and things like that you were speaking the truth the picard will be pleased and he's like so bummed and he's like what can we do to stop this like we have got to reverse this so this one guy who's been studying the Matakans tells Picard that these people are too primitive to understand that it's just science and not magic and that Picard should go down there and just like give him some commandments and like tell him like to do some good stuff. Are you suggesting you must go down to Mentaka 3 masquerading as a god? And Picard is like, absolutely not. I am not going to plunge these people back into the Dark Ages. I, I, it violates the prime directive of the Federation. And no, I gotta figure this out. So the whole thing culminates with Picard bringing this Mentalkan leader aboard the Enterprise to try to explain to her that he's not a god. Get up, you must not kneel to me. You do not wish it? I do not deserve it. I'm not a supreme being. I'm flesh and blood, like you. Not like me. Like you. And that he's just a man, and that his race and his technology is just further along than hers is, and she still has a really hard time grasping this and understanding it. That is my home? Seen from far, far above. Yet we do not fall. Your powers are truly boundless. The whole thing is pretty interesting because it directly parallels Eric von Daniken's theory that highly advanced extraterrestrials visited ancient man and ended up inspiring all these ancient religions. Can I say something about how shitty this packaging is? This is taped together on the spine. That's what's holding all these together. It's just tape. And it barely fits back in. See, I can't even get it back in here right now. Oh, that noise. I'm really surprised that Chariots of the Gods isn't taking this opportunity to repackage their books and say, this is the book that inspired Prometheus. They should totally do that. They're doing that with Lincoln. They did that with Lincoln. You know, these Lincoln books saying like, oh, these books inspired Lincoln. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I knew less about Prometheus, not more. I don't, I don't want to just theorize on anything else. Like, I, I don't, I really hope they don't make a sequel. I'll tell you that right now. Like, I 